Thank you, everyone. Um, I'll just say up, up front, uh, the, the flavor of my talk is going to be not to try and make this like a how-to to do like an RNA-seq experiment. I think we've seen lots of great data yesterday, and it's, it's quite, uh, you know, people know how to do it. Um, it the flavor is going to be how genomics has been, you know, utilized, particularly in the last few years, to improve our utility of particularly the Indian uh, origin rhesus macaque and get more value out of our studies. And so I'm going to go over some of the resources that, that are out there because a lot have grown really fast. And then I'm going to get into sort of two areas that I think uh, are a little bit more newer that genomics is really enhancing. Um, so why do we want to, you know, how do we want to apply genomics to NHPA's research? You know, we've been for many years using it as a reference for our various RNA-seq and transcomic analyses. Um, we've been working for many years, uh, people in this room, to get to a, an, an area where we can now start to understand allelic diversity of, of genes of interest. Um, People like David O'Connor have done a great job in using genomics to genotype some of these difficult, complex loci that are very important for when we're making decisions about recruitment of animals into our studies. And more recently, uh, efforts to be able to track the immune repertoire of the BCR and TCR are being engaged to try and understand how, how B cells and, and T cells are uh, evolving over time to vaccines. And lastly, in a more niche but important area, we saw yesterday the importance of comparative biology with with other natural host primates, and, and so genomics is kind of a wide open area that this is really, really a nice area to get, get into. So many years ago, Guido Silvestri and I wrote a, a commentary piece in Nature Biotech where we sort of predicted that there was going to be this boom time of, of monkey genomics, largely because Illumina sequencing came along and made, um, and made sequencing really affordable, and it, it made it so now labs could actually start to do it without having to need to go to a, a big sequencing center. And that's largely what's happened. So this is, this is currently the various states of, uh, my font didn't come out, but that was supposed to be a killer, uh, a killer joke there about all the various uh, pieces of the rhesus genome that's spread all over the place. But we've got you know, about 11 different assemblies right now in NCBI. Um, I've listed the, the really critical ones. So the first three that were done using the same animal um, have really sort of been the ones that have been the powerhouse users. Um, the first one, the first Indian origin rhesus macaque uh, genome was done by Rob Norgren at, at the University of Nebraska, and he's been very painstakingly uh, accurately annotating the genes. Um, the field has gone on and tried to improve on this even more as technology has gotten better, and so this animal has been then uh, applied with more deeper sequencing and long read sequencing to fill gaps. There's been a recent new deposition by Evan Eichler and colleagues of, of a very complete uh, rhesus genome that was just but, you know, it was just released February, and so we're still learning about it. And even in August, there was a new Chinese rhesus that was done with a very high resolution. And I'm going to talk a little bit more later about some of the ones that are uh, rhesus annotations that have come out that are more focus, focused on a particular area, and particularly in this case, it's the immune, uh, immunoglobulin loci. Um, I want to also point out that for people who may be interested in looking at allelic diversity outside of the complex immune loci, uh, there's been a huge amount of work by uh, Betsy Ferguson at, at, the, at Oregon, Jeff Rogers, and David O'Connor to try and compile a lot of the genomes that we have floating around out there into one comprehensive database. And so after this meeting, I'm going to Seattle to meet with them in, in, as part of a genetics genomics working group, and they're going to be really trying to, we're going to be discussing how to really roll this out to everybody. But I encourage people to go to this website and, 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 and get access and start being able to look at allelic variants for your gene of interest and understand that before you start a study. Okay, so one thing I've really been interested in is developing tools to help follow um, the B cell response in monkeys. And so, you know, um, a, a lot of the B cell work we've had over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years has been really elegant. It's really been uh, sort of overcoming the hurdles we thought that we're not going to be able to be overcome to try and get a neutralizing antibody vaccine response against the HIV. And so a lot of these studies have really been elegantly following how uh, the relationship between an immunogen and, and, the, and the BCR evolves over time. And we've, there's been a lot of amount of work to understand the impact of uh, follicular T cell health, adjuvants, uh, how to get durability. Um, a lot of uh, sequential in, uh, and incremental immunization strategies have co come along to try and nurture the B cell lung, but what I felt was missing was that w there wasn't a lot known about what was going on in the B cells themselves. And so mouse models have tried to approach this, but we wanted to be able to try and follow specific induced clones over time. Um, and that's why when single cell RNA-C came around, uh, as, as an immunologist, I was excited to try and employ this. So the idea that we came up with was to be able to do what we call fate tracking of clonotypes. And so if after a vaccine, you have a large number of naive B cells that expand, and these could be either uh, plasmablasts or um, antigen-specific memory B cells. Q 
can you start to um, use the clonotypes of these ind individual cells as, as what we call barcodes and then infer what happens to their fate over time by looking at the clonotypes. So for example, if you had a clonotype that was expanded uh, really early on after a, vac after, after a vaccine in the plasmoblast pool, uh, some of your clonotypes are going to end up entering into the long-lived antibody secreting uh, population in the bone marrow. Some might have desirable qualities for developing VNAPs, such as high levels of somatic hypermutation. Some might expand really efficiently. Can we infer anything er about the early vaccine response in time by attaching the transcriptome of what's going on in these cells to the clonotype? And so um, some of the tools we built was, was to get really good at doing single cell RNA-seq. This is an, uh, not 10x single cell RNA-seq. This is plate-based and where we compared uh, vaccine-induced uh, plasma blasts after BG505 SOSA vaccination uh, to those induced by flu vaccines in humans, and we found that we could really have uh, these, these cells were really re recapitulating most of the, the features that we see in human cells, particularly the expression of, of the lineage-defining transcription factors and the cell surface expression. So we had resolution to really finely tune, um, get into B cell biology, even in very uh, closely related subsets. Um, the next thing we did was try to build a pipeline that we could actually track the clonotypes, and so. I watched, I guess, too many Thor movies, so we called it Balder, which is, which is a Nordic god of, of truth and enlightenment. It might have been 2016, the election was around, so I, I, tried to, you know, I tried to go there. These jokes will hit one day, I promise. Um, the so to, to develop this pipeline, we started with human. Um, we wanted to be able to reconstruct B cell, heavy and lightweight BCR sequences from uh, single cell RNA-seq data. We, we started by uh, vaccinating humans, uh, sorting into 96 well plates, and then splitting our 10 microliter aliquot with our single cell in it into two aliquots, one that went for sequencing and the one, for, one that went for conventional PCR. And I'm going to skip a lot of the slides in the interest of time, but what we came up with was that when we do this and we use de novo reconstruction and a various number of diff differing filtering met metrics, we get uh, multiple models of our heavy and light chain. So each, each column here, each dot is a single um, uh, uh, the expression of a single reconstructed heavy chain, and then in the second column is the runner-up from the same, same cell, and then so on and so on. And in the plasma blast, because you have so much, um, I forgot to point out that these are the heavy and light chains uh, in, in a uh, um, bioanalyzer trace of a single B cell that's amplified, or a single plasma blast, and these two spikes are actually the heavy and light chains. So these are little antibody factories. And you have so many sequences that you'll get, you'll get aberrant models, but what we found is that you know, there's clearly always a winning model. In, in normal CD20 positive B cells, we don't have this. We just have a single mo a model that comes out. And if we look at the ratios, we're always getting more than, for most cells, more than 100 to 1 uh, distinction in our, in our chains. And the one, times when we do have uh, less distinction, these end up being nearly identical sequences anyways. So the punchline is that if we use a, our defining criteria as the, getting the correct VDJ assignment or VJ assignment to call a clonotype in the heavy and light chains, um, our assay is pretty much 100% accurate um, for both plasma blasts and, and B cells. We do have a drop off here when we try to use direct mapping and what we found out was that the incompleteness of, of a reference genome, you lose reads and the model will try to force bad reads into its identification and so the solution for that was really quick, it was really easy. We just took unmapped reads, so things that were falling out of our alignments, throw that back in and then the information is there to make a correct assignment of, of the MMI chain. Um, if we actually take it down to the nucleotide level, we're studying plasmoblasts or, or memory B cells. There's a lot of somatic hypermutations away from germline. This is an example of our population when we compare the um, plasmoblasts according to the nearest identified clonotype and the number of uh, 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 germline, sorry, the number of mutations away from germline. We have a pretty high number of average of 21 nucleotide changes, but even in this uh, type of high mutation background, we were having near 100% accuracy at the nucleotide level. So this is what we call a drop-off plot. Each line is a collection of single cells, and we're comparing our PCR region of interest versus our sequence, and we're finding that with the exception of about five out of over 200, we were having 100% nucleotide identity. So we're very accurate at doing this. Now, you know, that was for human. That was fairly easy because there's a lot of really good databases out there, but we wanted to build this for NHPs. And so, um, to give you an idea of the state of the immunoglobulin references, this is, IMG, this is the IMGT database, and this is the most authoritative, highly used database out there for IG analysis. Um, in 2012, um, uh, Ganella Hedestam had published a paper where she just started really delving into uh, characterizing rhesus uh, V genes and had identified 63, and as of to date, there's still only 19 uh, V genes listed in there. So it's really underrepresented, and the reason for this is because B cells are tough to actually 
find a new allele because, you, you know, you can get a sequence, but it could be somatic hypermutation. So the restrictions for uploading your data in here require that you, you actually get DNA sequencing and you have haplotype frequency. So it's not easy to update this accurately. But the field needs this to go forward. Um, another just sort of example is, you know, some of the mo more popular references. Um, the genome I like to use a lot is MACAM, and it does have the uh, heavy and light chain loci misassigned to this, uh, according to a more recent reference. And that actually doesn't matter, as I'll show in the, in the next slide. Um, okay, so can we improve bioinformatics? So we've got a lot of problems still. We've got, you know, if, if you don't have good germline reference data, you can't, you know, you can't even call your chronotypes correctly. Um, it's very hard to follow uh, somatic hypermutations and, and understand how, how, you know, how impactful your vaccine or adjuvant is. It's difficult to track the lineages, and you might actually even start cloning the wrong antibody out if, if, if you're relying on, on, uh, on reference, aligning to a reference. Okay, so there is hope, and it's, in, it's not named Tom, although he's here. Um, we can use template, swi template switch Riotan PCR to be able to remove dependence to pulling out um, antibodies based on known V genes. And then long read sequencing technologies has really helped to resolve the, the loci. And then there are a number of no novel bioinformatics techniques for us to, to infer germline risk sequences to start to do our work in, in the absence of a genome. Um, one of the first things we did was to try and re re reconfigure the Balder pipeline to be accurate for monkey B cells. That's five minutes already. Okay. Um, we used a novel. Um, we switched up our filtering algorithm, and we were able to um, test it on a number of uh, vaccine-induced, pla uh, either SOSIP-induced plasma blasts or SOSIP-induced germinal center B cells. And long story short, we were able to get accurate uh, calls uh, of our VDJs versus PCR, and the gold standard was to be able to pull out these uh, um, genes and do um, cloning, uh, clone these genes out and test against the antigen. Um, more recently, we've also made a uh, long read assembly. So we sequenced a Yerkes animal uh, using pac bio technology. We took a perfused kidney so that we got all the T and B cells out so we didn't have germline re rearrangements of the, of the immune loci. Um, and really, in sequencing a single animal, I just want to point out that we were able to more than double or triple sometimes the known alleles that were available at IMGT and even, even sort of double the ones that were available at NCBI. So by a single animal, we, we got a lot of information. These are some of the various references that are out there that have, that have attempted to collect uh, immune globulin sequences. Um, we've built our own in-house uh, database. And then we've also used inference informatics to try and get novel alleles. And to test which is the better method, we um, started uh, doing repertoire sequencing and counting the number of uh, inferred mutations. And we did this by uh, making an inferred germline database of individual animals. And we also did this using our combined database and a number of, of other databases, including this IMGT. And the take home point here is that if you use a standard database out there, you're, very, you're, you're grossly overestimating the number of somatic hypermutations in there. And the best methods are making a combined database or, if you can't do that, are doing a, a reference of that monkey itself. But clearly we think that this tells us the way forward is to do uh, a reference database. Another reason that we can't rely on inference alone is because um, it's incomplete. It's accurate, but it's incomplete. And to, sh to illustrate this, we did rep sequencing on a number of uh, our animals, including our pack bio sequence animal and its, mo and its mother. And what we found is out of a total of uh, over 50 overlapping alleles between the, the, our, our pack bio animal and its mom, we only had about 12 alleles in common. So they were accurate, but we're not, it's not doing enough. To address this um, and build towards a permanent solution, we've recently been able to get funding to try and build a reference assembly. And this leverages the um, genetics and parentage that we have at the Yerkes Primate Center with long read sequencing. And uh, the gist of it is that we sort out B cell, naive B cells and um, non-B non cells we are doing RepSeq to get a big library of potential V-genes. We use this to build a capture array, pull down DNA sequences and do pack bio sequencing, and then we can go back and use that to inform the haplotypes of a number of, uh, of, of the offspring monkeys. Um, all right. And so to put it all into action, um, why would, we, why would we care to do all this B cell analysis? And I just want to show a vignette of a recent study that was done at Yerkes where um, we, had done, we had collaborated with Shane Crotty and, and, and Daryl Irvine to uh, vaccinate monkeys with BG505 SOSIP envelope trimer. Um, and in this case, we wanted to test the impact of changing the, um, uh, changing the mode of delivery. And so it was comparing a bolus injection versus a pump injection. And we had a very remarkable finding where the animals that were getting the bolus injection had no um, autologous neutralizing antibodies, the animals that were getting pumps, almost all of them, even though they got the same quantity of vaccine um, over, the, over a period of time, actually all developed newts. And so when we 
did rep seek, or repertoire analyses on the uh, germinal center B cells, we found that the bolus animals tended to have a more restricted um, um, usage of different uh, of, of V genes. We then used the Balder uh, method and, and uh, sequenced single cells, got the pairs, and Andrew Ward uh, took these pairs and mapped exactly where the, these antibodies were binding or the dominant antibodies were binding from these different monkeys and showed that in the bolus animals you had a really restricted, uh, more restricted binding to the envelope uh, and tended to be on the base of the immunogen, which was kind of useless. And lastly, in the animals that were getting the pumps, we had a more broad usage. Um, I don't really have a lot of time to whip through comparative genomics, so I'm just going to do the highlights. We sequenced the Sudi Mangabe at, uh, at uh, the Yerkes Primate Center. Jason Branchley gave a really nice uh, overview of the Sudi of the natural hosts and why they're important. Um, they don't get AIDS. So I'm not going to go through the phenotype. Um, we had done a, a, a pretty decent assembly with Jeff Rogers at, at um, Baylor Genome Institute. Getting an assembly is great, um, but the automated assembly pipelines tend to actually make a lot of mistakes in actually where they put start and stop things. So to try and go through and find genes of interest that might be divergent with a, with a rhesus macaque or a human by, by hand is, is virtually impossible. So we created a pipeline that used the uh, really fine-tuned hand annotation of genes by Rob Norgren's genome, and I'm at zero. So I will point out that the punchline that, you know, screening through all these genes, we came up with one gene that was really interesting. This was TLR4 that had a mutation uh, and, um, that caused it to have a read-through. Um, it was conserved in multiple other natural hosts. Um, we tested this. The, the impact of TLR4, I think, for most people in the room is going to be uh, obvious. I, I don't update my slide anymore because Jason keeps getting a lot of references with his original paper of the tr microbial translocation. Uh, we did map the TLR4 mutation to um, LPS responsiveness, and we found that in SUDIs they had a much attenuated response to, uh, TLR, to TLR4 and LPS signaling. And when we did a, a mutation analysis where we swapped in um, the rhesus, uh, so we swapped in the SUDI tail into the rhesus, the rhesus tail into the SUDI, we actually were able to, to recover um, signaling of, of NF kappa B in, uh, in, in uh, HEC 293 T cells. So are we able to go from a full genome down to an actual mutation and max the activity? All right, sorry for going a minute or two over time, but just, you know, to, to make my take-home points, I think that there's a lot of nice new algorithms that can track BCR chronotypes um, from single-cell RNA-seq data, even in natural um, non-human primates, and this is going to be important for understanding the evolution of, of, of antibodies in these, in these germline targeting vaccines. Um, we do need to, to build a universal reference for immunoglobulins uh, to be able to do this efficiently. Um, as we start to move uh, monkeys in our, in, in our um, NPRCs into germline targeting and, uh, and lineage-based vaccines, we need to understand the um, uh, immunoglobulin genotypes. So genotyping is going to be an important aspect of, of our activities at NPRC. And lastly, hopefully I've been able to make a pitch for, you know, why we, now that we have these genomic toys, why doing comparative studies of natural hosts is, is, is a brave new world and there's a lot more that we can learn from these, these animals. And a lot of these studies have gone on to nice um, either clinical trials or, or, very, or very impactful downstream studies, and so we've, we've got a lot of translational uh, impact out of our various genomics. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and really point out the, the work of Amit Opeje and, and Amber that did all the molecular biology and bioinformatics for all the B-cell work I showed, and uh, David Pelesh who did a lot of the uh, work on the Sudi Mangabe nature paper. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your time and answer any questions you may have. I think we have time for one or maybe two short questions. So uh, when do you think the uh, IG database will be available to so we, Yeah, we, we have like a sort of cobbled together one that we share with people and um, we, we collaborate with um, Andrew Ward as well that's, that's compiling one. We're hoping by next May to have all of our sequencing done and have a really comprehensive uh, reference. And I should point out that we have an agreement from IMGT to be able to take this information since we'll have haplotype frequency and DNA and actually it'll incorporate all that into IMGT that anybody out anywhere can easily access without having to email me or email something like that. Any other questions?